The forest habitats of the Amur tiger are covered in deep snow for much of the year. It can't be said that the tiger considers this a good thing, but it certainly makes the specialists who study and protect this rare predator happy. For in the snow, it's impossible to move without leaving tracks. And this means that with a sufficient number of trackers, who know how to read winter's snowy pages, Russia can count all of its tigers with fairly high accuracy. And so every 10 years, a massive effort is organized in the Russian Far East. The simultaneous survey of the Amur tiger across its entire range. In February, around 2,000 qualified trackers will simultaneously walk their transects, providing the organizers of their survey priceless data, not only about tigers, but also about the animals which are their prey. Tiger Tracking Basics The main task of a tracker in the tiger survey is to record all tiger tracks detected along his or her transect. When he encounters tracks, he is required to record in his survey journal not only the coordinates of the trail, but also several important parameters. The direction of the tiger's movement, the freshness of the tracks, the size of the paw print. Now let's determine what kind of knowledge a tracker should have so that he does not end up walking his difficult transect in vain, and so that he doesn't become the butt of the famous insult by the legendary Far Eastern hunter Dersu Uzala. You have eyes and head, but nothing understand. It's perfectly clear that the first thing the tracker should decide is whether he is indeed looking at the track of an Amur tiger. Track Identification At first glance, differentiating a tiger track from the tracks of other animals of the Usuri taiga is a simple task. First of all, amongst all the region's predators, only big cats have the ability to withdraw their claws while walking, which they do to preserve their dagger-like sharpness. And so the tracks of wolves, bears, and all members of the weasel family, without exception, show claw marks. Second of all, all of our predators, besides felines and canines, show five digits in their tracks. So if you find a large track with four digits, it is either a tiger or a wolf. But the wolf cannot retract its claws. Thirdly, only bears can compete with tigers for the size of their tracks. However, brown bears and white-breasted bears hibernate during the winter. Rarely, of course, individuals can wake up and leave their den. But bears, again, have five digits and what's more, unretractable claws. So differentiating a tiger track from other tracks is a pretty easy task, if you make the comparison based on the ideal prints shown in trackers' guidebooks. But the real world snowy taiga throws quite a few surprises at tiger trackers. Because in deep powdery snow, you often come across not clearly defined tracks, but simply a string of holes. If the snow is especially deep, you may just see a trench left by some animal or another. And so to uncover this forest mystery, you'll have to put in some real effort. Sometimes it is worth walking some distance, stepping in the animal's tracks. The tiger is the only wild animal in this region in whose tracks a human can comfortably walk. The length of their pace and the width of their path both line up with ours. But it is very uncomfortable for a person to walk in a bear's track. The distance between their right and left paws is just too wide. But even if from first glance you could recognize the track of a tiger, you'll still have to work up a good sweat, since it is necessary to record in your survey journal several important track parameters. Track Direction Determining to where the owner of a track was moving is very important, not only from a scientific, but also from a survival point of view. From the scientific point of view, without this parameter, the survey coordinators cannot piece together a comprehensive picture from the mosaic of different trackers' survey journals. And in that case, the analysis of results will not produce a correct figure about tiger populations. And from the survival point of view, It is not the best idea to follow closely behind a tiger and breathe down its neck. This king of the taiga may not understand that you are stalking him for purely scientific purposes. 
Thus, it's a much smarter and healthier habit to track tigers backwards, that is, to go in the opposite direction that the tiger was moving in. It would seem that determining the direction that an animal was moving in is a simple task. It's pretty unlikely that they would walk through the forest tail first. Thus, we can be assured that the animal moves in the direction that its digits are pointed in. Pretty simple. If you are to determine the direction based on the ideal drawings in a tracker's guidebook. But again, the real world snowy taiga throws quite a few surprises at tiger trackers. In deep powdery snow, you will often come across not detailed prints, but simply a string of holes. And so to uncover this forest mystery, you'll have to put in some real effort. Look carefully at the impression left by the track, and you will recognize a very characteristic profile. When walking, the animal plunges its paw into the snow at an angle, plowing up the snow and leaving a furrow. When the animal pulls its paw out of the snowpack, it throws small clumps of snow forward. The configuration of tracks can vary strongly based on snow depth, from oval holes to extended furrows, but this spray of snow always occurs in the direction the animal was moving. This allows the tracker, in any weather conditions, to accurately determine the direction the animal was moving in after inspecting a number of tracks. Incidentally, this little spray of snow in front of the track helps us to determine the next, no less important parameter. Freshness of the track. It is impossible to conduct an accurate analysis of tiger populations if we only know the direction of the tracks of tigers observed by survey trackers, but do not have information about the track's freshness. And so in the instructions for participants in the tiger survey, there is a simple but very meaningful phrase. It is necessary to determine the actual realistic age of the track and not fantasize. Determining the age of a track is certainly not a simple task. This is already a taiga art. But a few basic principles can be easily passed along. Let's recall the throwing forward of a small spray of snow from the track. If the track is fresh, from today, then these clumps will lie loosely on the surface of the snow, each individually distinguishable. But with time, these clumps begin to sag, blending into the snow's surface. And then the track itself begins to gradually sag and collapse, losing its initial form. Let's look at how quickly this process unfolds. The tiger survey takes place in February. In that month, daytime temperatures differ from nighttime temperatures by 10 to 15 degrees. Because of this, the greatest changes in snow structure and the visual appearance of the track occur in the daylight hours. Thus, the tracker can easily recognize tracks from morning and afternoon animal activity since they have not begun to freeze. Tracks from the night before are little changed since low nighttime temperatures help to preserve them, but they feel frozen to the touch. Tracks from yesterday morning have already been exposed to the sun's rays and to high daytime temperatures, and so the contours of the track and the clumps of snow that were thrown forward from the track appear to have sagged. But recall that assessing the freshness of a track by eye is a risky method, since the same track can appear entirely different depending on light conditions. And so it is necessary to back up a visual assessment of track age with a touch test of how frozen it is. And also remember that with time the track in the snow not only loses its form, but grows in size. Thus, measuring the size of a tiger track without determining its freshness can lead to mistakes during analysis of the results. Track Measurement Even knowing the direction and age of all tiger tracks recorded in the survey, we still cannot create an accurate picture of the tiger population. And so the most important parameter is the size of the tiger paw print. At first look, measuring a paw print seems like the simplest of tasks. Grab a measuring tape, hold it across the widest point of the track, and write down the size. Mm -hmm. You just need to observe a few simple rules, which are easier to show than to explain.
But in real-life taiga conditions, things are more complicated. When the snow is deep and powdery, it is impossible to measure the paw print since there are no clear edges to it. In this case, it is necessary to follow the tiger trail to a place where the snow is less deep. In search of a suitable print for measurement, you will need to follow the tracks until they lead to an area with fresh snow on top of a layer of crusted snow, or to a forest road, which tigers often use in deep snow conditions, or to the track of a snowmobile. But these are not all of the complications. It is well known that the prints of a tiger's front paws are wider than those of its back paws by about one centimeter. Thus, it is preferable to measure the size of the front paws. Only in the real world, tigers place their back paws into the hole left in the snow by their front paws when walking. This makes measuring the front paw quite difficult, especially if the tiger is moving in a straight line, in which case it's nearly impossible. If you're lucky, you can follow the path of the animal to a marking tree, since when the tiger leaves its mark, it places its front and back paws in different places. Or you might stumble onto a place where the tiger lay down to survey its surroundings. In such a case, the front paws will also make prints in the snow separate from the back paws. But more often, you will have to just measure the back paws in the hole left by the front, or indeed, the combined track created by the two paw prints, one on top of the other. Thus, when measuring the tracks, it is necessary to indicate which paw was measured, front, back, or combined. But even this is not all. The size of the tracks of a single tiger on the move differed depending on how it was moving and on the density of the snow. Thus, you need to take several different measurements and write the average size in your survey journal. If the width of the track is greater than 10 centimeters, this means that you are dealing with an adult male. If the width is from 8 to 10 centimeters, then it is an adult female. If less than 8 centimeters, it is a tiger cub. And for trackers in the southern portions of Primoria, the taiga has prepared one more conundrum for you. For here, on one territory, live four different wild cats. Tiger, leopard, lynx, and the far eastern forest cat. And the size of a tiger cub track correlates with that of an adult leopard. So in order to avoid mistakes, trackers here should pay special attention. An experienced tracker knows that a leopard in motion holds its digits together, unlike a tiger which spreads them apart. So a tiger track forms an almost perfect circle, while a leopard track is closer to an oval. And the paws of these southerly leopards have almost no winter down, and thus leave a more defined print of the naked digits. But it is not worth relying solely on such subjective parameters. It is worth walking along an uncertain track for some distance, gauging the behavior of the animal. An adult leopard moves through its territory confidently and sensibly, choosing the path with the least snow and the greatest visibility. Territorial males tend to leave characteristic scrapes every 100 to 200 meters along their trail. But a tiger cub, with paws of this size, should always be together with its mother. If for some reason it is left alone at this age, then this inexperienced animal will have a far from optimal path, which will often end up in dense thickets and blowdowns. And he does not mark his territory. A similar dilemma arises with the tracks of a leopard cub, which are comparable in size to that of an adult lynx. And so to avoid mistakes, it is worth following these recommendations. You should keep in mind that the lynx is an animal of the north, well adapted to winter conditions. The bottom of its paws are covered in thick, rough hair, and it walks on the snow as if in valinki, Russian felt boots. Thus, its tracks are blurred, without clear edges. And with the Far Eastern Forest Cat, no such problems should arise, since its paw prints are smaller than the print of a single digit of a tiger's paw. And so, good luck to you on the tiger trail.